Welcome everybody to the Christian Marauder. So glad y'all are here today. I have a very special guest. He's back. Derek Gilbert, welcome to the Christian Marauder. Brian, it's good to be back. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I know both of us have been on vacation for a little bit. We've been up to Tetons. You've been to St. Louis and taking pictures of strange buildings and all kinds of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, we spent a few weeks in uh, in Israel back in, in March, and early April, and uh, we did some really interesting research there as well. So uh, the second half of this year, we pray that we uh, get the uh, the videos together that we uh, plan to release. We've got uh, all of the videos cataloged now, so we know what we shot. We just need to uh, kind of tie them all together. And uh, we, we think that we have found the actual baptismal site of Jesus, which is not where most people think it is. In fact, I'm not aware of anybody who's um, well, very few anyway, I, who have uh, named the location where we think it is. Um, uh, we also think that the Valley of the Shadow of Death is a literal place and not just a figure of speech. And we uh, can uh, we, we plan in the video that we're working on to uh, show that as well. So, yeah, we've we've had a very interesting first half of the year. The second half looks to be just as interesting, although a lot of it will involve editing video. That's a lot of work. So you have a conference coming up here in the end of July, I think, if I'm right there. Why don't you tell yeah. us about that and invite people to come if they can? Well, yeah, it's the Go Therefore conference. Dr. Mike Spaulding and his wife, Kathy Spaulding, are putting this together. It's in Brookville, Ohio, which is suburban Dayton. So it'll be Friday and Saturday, the 28th and 29th. Um, it's, it's a great lineup of speakers. And I don't have the names in front of me, so I'll probably forget someone. But L.A. Marzulli, Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer. Uh, Dr. Mike Lake, uh, Vicki Joy Anderson, Tom Dunn, uh, Dr. Gregory Reed, who we really, really appreciate. He's uh, been on the front lines of spiritual warfare for decades, uh, as have Tom Dunn and Vicki Joy Anderson. Uh, Kenny C., Pastor Casper McLeod, um, David Hevner, and uh, like I said, I know I'm forgetting some folks. But anyway, it's a wonderful lineup. And given that we are all getting a little older um, this, I, I would encourage people to take advantage of this opportunity to see this gathering in, in one place. It's at the Harvest Revival Center in Brookville, Ohio, which is outside Dayton. Pastor Neil Peterson is letting us use the church. So it's a, it's a really comfortable setting for this because uh, it's got a great sound system. Um, I'll be showing some really good high def um, drone footage of the areas that I'm, you know, that, that we visited in Israel back in March, showing some of these megalithic sites that we visited. And so you'll be able to see these really clearly, and you'll be sitting in nice, comfortable padded pews instead of the folding chairs that you get at a hotel uh, conference setting. Um, so it's, it's just $59 if you're in Western Ohio, Southern Michigan, Eastern Indiana, take, take the day or two and, and come out and see this uh, gathering because it's really going to be amazing. I mean, Eli Marzulli is worth the price of admission alone, but when you get all of us together, Sharon and I will both be speaking. And um, uh, it's uh, again, uh, go there for conference online, go there for conference.com. And if you can't go there, uh, if you don't have the ability to travel, if uh, you've already got plans for that weekend, then take advantage of the streaming video because Mike Spaulding is uh, set up with the, uh, the video team at the church. The media team at Harvest Revival Center is fantastic. So this will be really good streaming video and um, get, get some of this stuff this way. Because uh, in my video talk, I plan to show, uh, again, what we talked about here just a minute ago, the baptismal site of Jesus and the valley of the shadow of death and why those locations are really important. Um, Jesus based his ministry in the Upper Galilee for some reason. And I had never really thought about this before until really about the last year or so. Why, why did he base his ministry at Capernaum, which is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee? I mean, he was there to, you know, bring people to the Lord. He went to Jerusalem, called the Temple on the, uh, on the Temple Mount, my father's house, but that's a really, really long walk from Capernaum. Again, it's on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And I think that's where Jesus was baptized, just a little north of there, the Jordan River, north of the Sea of Galilee, which is not where most people think it is. It's, what, it's not where UNESCO says it is. The United Nations designated a site near, near Jericho, down near, uh, on the Jordan side of the river, down near Jericho, close to the Dead Sea, as the official baptismal site. And the Kingdom of Jordan, God bless them, 
spending about $300 million to turn it into a tourist site, which, you know, is fine because Jordan doesn't really have much in the way of natural resources. But if, if you really look at the clues, the geographic clues in the Gospel of John especially, you can see that he had to be north of the Sea of Galilee. And then when you look at Matthew chapter 4, uh, his move, Jesus' move from Nazareth to Capernaum, was in fulfillment of prophecy, and that connects to the valley of the shadow of death. But even more than that, there was a group of Essenes. You know, these are the people we all, you know, the, the Essenes. So they were at Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls and all that. Yeah, but in the second century BC, there was a split. There was a group that went south to Qumran and another group that stayed north by the Sea of Galilee. And they wrote the second section of the book that we call the Book of First Enoch. And that section, chapters 37 through 71, called the Book of Parables or the Similitudes of Enoch by scholars, actually influenced the New Testament to quite a degree. And um, the fact is that they were writing this probably, according to like really brand new research within the last two years by a, a physician who works in the old city of Jerusalem. His name is Dr. John Ben Daniel. Credit where it's due. It's his research of putting all of this stuff together from scholars who study the book of First Enoch and the Dead Sea Scrolls and all of this stuff. And he said, you know, these caves in this really prominent mountain on the west side of the Sea of Galilee at the north end of the Sea of Galilee, near the ancient city of Magdala, is where this community of Essenes wrote the book of parables, which was the last section of the book of First Enoch that was uh, completed. And from there, you can look down from these caves, you know, a couple hundred feet above the ground, you know, above, above the, the level of the, the, the lake. And you can see, okay, Capernaum's over there, and Bethsaida, which is where Peter and Andrew and Philip are from, is over there. And oh, look, there's Mount Hermon off in the distance. Hmm. And they wrote this section that was really influential on the New Testament. So I, you can tell I'm a little excited about it because I think this is really really fascinating, number one. But number two, I think it helps us understand why we should at least pay attention to the book of First Enoch, at least the first 70 chapters of it. Um, some of the later stuff is, it gets kind of weird. And there's some, you know, there's some contradictory stuff inside the book of Enoch, which is why it's not in the Bible. It's not part of the canon. But there, there are reasons, good reasons, to look at it and, and take some of these things seriously. So I'm going to put all that, you know, the second section, this book of parables, and explain why this was so influential on the early Christian church and why it's so important that Jesus based his ministry in the North, because I think Jesus validated what had come out of this book of parables. I, I think that whoever it was that wrote that section of the book of Enoch, it might have been multiple authors, probably according to scholars who study this stuff for a living, written by a group of Essenes living near the Sea of Galilee, I think they, they were in, in, inspired. Again, I'm not saying it should be in the Bible, but I think they were inspired enough that it prepared the ground for the ministry of John the Baptist, and then for the coming, the one who called himself the Son of Man, Jesus. Hmm. That's interesting. Now you got me hooked. I got to know what the, what those chapters are. I have to go back and read it. Mm. It sounds very interesting. Can you give yeah. us kind of like a little uh, a teaser? <laughs> well, again, the, the first 36 chapters, 1 through 36, are called the Book of Watchers. And that really expands on the story in Genesis chapter 6, which is, you know, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were fairer. They took wives of any they chose. And the Nephilim or the giants were in the earth in those days. And also after that, whenever they went into the, the daughters of man, um, that doesn't really give us a whole lot of information, but first Enoch chapters one through 36 expands on this. It names these rebellious sons of God and um, shows what they did. That was so evil. They basically had two major sins. Number one, they corrupted the bloodline of humanity by commingling their seed with the seed of men. Uh, and number two was they taught us things we weren't supposed to know, forbidden knowledge. And the leader, the chief of the Watchers, is named Shemiyaza. He's sort of the central character in my book, The Second Coming of Saturn, because I argue that Shemiyaza is the same entity that the Romans called Saturn, the Greeks called Kronos, the Canaanites called El, 
The Babylonians called Enlil, the Assyrians called Asher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think he's also the destroyer, Abaddon or Apollyon, who comes out in Revelation 9. And I go through and show through the, the text and through the Bible why I you know, make that case. Um, that He was one of the leaders. The other is Azazel or Azael, probably more accurate, who was responsible for teaching us all of these things we weren't supposed to know, like sorcery, witchcraft, divination, uh, metalworking, especially to make weapons and uh, other things. So they were sort of like the two ringleaders of this, uh, of this rebellion. All of that, and then their punishment is outlined in the first 36 chapters of First Enoch. Beginning in chapter 37, we get to a prophetic section. And uh, this, according to scholars, 36 through 71 was the last section of the book of First Enoch. There are chapters after chapter 71, uh, 72 through, uh, I think, 108. Um, and those were written after, or between, I should say, chapters 1 through 36, the book of Watchers, um, and before the book of Parables. The book of Parables was the last section of First Enoch that was composed. It was written. It was probably written um, in the last part of the first century BC. So just before the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus, very close probably to the, uh, the death of Herod the Great. And again, this is a prophetic section that looks ahead to uh, justice coming back to the earth. And there is a character who is mentioned again and again in this, uh, uh, this book of parables. And he, he's called by a few names. One is uh, the chosen one, another is the anointed one. And, uh, but the one that's used most often 17 times is the son of man. Now we're familiar with that term because that appears like 82 times in the New Testament, most often spoken by Jesus himself. But what we don't realize that most of us, and I've been taught this, uh, think that this comes from Daniel chapter 7, where he's got a vision of the throne room of God, and he sees the Ancient of Days, and at the right hand of the Ancient of Days is one like a son of man. And that phrase, son of man, is a Hebrew phrase that normally means human. And we see it in the book of Ezekiel a lot, where the angel who's guiding him around and showing him stuff calls him son of man. It's not the Son of Man as we think about it from Jesus, reference to himself as the Son of Man. It's just a Hebrew phrase. It means human one. And that's how it's used in Daniel chapter 7. The only thing we see in this, this vision is that he is given an everlasting kingdom, and dominion will never be taken away from him. But he doesn't actually do anything. He's just there in the throne room of God. It's clear that he is the second power in heaven, you know, uh, well, this would be a Christophany, basically. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I mean, you've got the Ancient of Days, that's Yahweh, and then this second power in heaven who receives a kingdom is uh, what Dr. Michael Heiser used to say, or used to refer to as Yahweh, but not Yahweh. Uh, he would be the angel, like the angel of Yahweh who would appear to Moses or Joshua in the, in the Old Testament, to Christophanies in the Old Testament. But again, in the book of Daniel, he doesn't really do anything. He's just there. He receives a kingdom. But in 1st Enoch chapters 37 to 71, the book of parables, he is active. Uh, he is God's agent of justice. He's the one who returns and punishes Azazel and the sinful angels. He punishes wicked kings and evil landowners and gre greedy people who have forgotten about God. So suddenly now, this guy, this, this character, the son of man, not one like a son of man, the son of man is playing an active role in this judgment that is coming on the earth. And there, there are some reasons why the, the Essenes were looking for the Messiah in that first century BC. They, they took the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, literally, and they were looking for uh, the Messiah's arrival 490 years after the destruction of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar in 586. So somewhere around the year 90 BC, they were expecting the Messiah, and he didn't show up. And then they had uh, the Romans come in and sort of take over things, and, uh, 
And then the Parthians came in and, and took over and kicked out the Romans. And then Herod the Great came in with the support of Mark Antony and the Romans, and he kicked out the Parthians. And in fact, there was a, commu- a, a portion of the Essenes, apparently, who thought that Herod the Great might be the Messiah. Hmm. Because, okay, maybe we had the dates wrong, but he's coming back and he's kicking out the Parthians. And yeah, this is awesome. And then they realized it wasn't him because he was not a nice man. Um, So by the end of the first century BC, the Essenes were like, okay, it's not going to be a literal, you know, it's been delayed. The Messiah is still coming. He's just been delayed. But there were a group of people around the Sea of Galilee who were apparently aware of the writings of this group. And they were aware of that term. I mean, you remember in the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus takes the disciples to Caesarea Philippi at the foot of Mount Hermon, he asks them, who do people say the Son of Man is? It's like, okay, obviously they knew what that phrase meant, or at least the disciples did. And then, of course, he asked them, who do you say that I am? And as I mentioned, Jesus referred to himself dozens of times in the New Testament, at least six dozen times, as the Son of Man, as the and prophesying his own return as the Son of Man to bring this judgment, basically equating himself with this character who was uh, explicitly identified as the agent of God's judgment in First Enoch, but in no other Jewish writing prior to the first century BC. In other words, This character, the Son of Man, does not appear in the Old Testament anywhere. You can argue that he was inspired by Daniel chapter 7. That's okay. But he didn't, in in Daniel 7, this one like a Son of Man didn't really play an active role in anything. That comes out in the book of 1 Enoch. And there are scholars who've really gone into some detail as to why this is so. Okay, he's drawing some on Isaiah, and he's drawing some on, you know, Zechariah. Okay, fine. The bottom line for me, though, was that this book was completed around the time of the death of Herod the Great. He died in 4 BC, which is about a year before John the Baptist and Jesus were born. And then 30 years later, John the Baptist, who some of his teachings, by the way, like this idea of a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, um, that would not have been acceptable to the Essenes at Qumran, the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But it probably was okay with the Essenes in the north. The reason for the split was that the Essenes who went south to Qumran thought the rest of these guys were just way too liberal. (laughs) Apparently, they they weren't wanting to follow as many rules. But John was teaching this thing and prophesying that one was coming, you know, the sandal strap, uh, whose sandal strap he was not worthy to untie. And then Jesus shows up and identifies himself as the Son of Man, which validates at least that part of the book of First Enoch. And again, the fact that it was written within sight of the Sea of Galilee, of the place where Jesus based his ministry, of the place where Jesus was baptized, and of Mount Hermon, I think is just absolutely fascinating. That is, that is. That got me thinking here. I did a study a while back, I mean, many years ago, and I did it on, um, on the book of John. And so, and but anyway, I, in Matthew 16, there where Peter says, and Peter says, "You're Christ, the Son of the Living God." Right. That actually would make more sense to me because I did this study and uh, I found out that I didn't notice there were a split between Essenes. I didn't even look at the Essenes, but I knew that in that area around the Galilee where you're talking, they were looking for the Messiah based upon Daniel. And they were, right. so they had a, a, they were looking for the son of man. That's who they were looking for. And the only way that he could be the judge of the earth would be that he would be God manifest in human flesh. You know, and that's, that's the emphasis where uh, Peter says, you're Christ, the son of the living God. In other words, you, you right. are the judge. You, you're, you're it. Tag, you're it. You know, yeah. and, and right on, right below Mount Hermon. <laughs> Oh, that's the thing. <laughs> that's the thing is that he took them there from Capernaum, which is about a 30 mile walk. I mean, for us today, 30 miles is like, you know, no big deal. I used to drive about that far to get to work on a daily basis, a round trip anyway. I mean, you know, for us going 30 miles to go shopping at a great outlet mall is no big deal. But back then, that was a two or three day walk. 
through some pretty rugged terrain. Um, they had to go through this this valley that is uh, that the Jordan River runs through between Mount Hermon or just south of Mount Hermon and the Sea of Galilee. It used to be a marsh uh, called the Hula Marsh, H-U-L-E-H. Uh, the Israelis drained that back in the 1950s. So again, they were kind of able to walk around the marsh and the hills there go up and down. And it's, it's, it's a hike. When you read the sequence of events in the Gospels, they had just returned not long before that from their trip to the uh, region of Phoenicia around the city of Tyre and Sidon, where he healed the daughter of the Syro-Phoenician woman. Well, the road from Tyre leading back toward the, uh, that valley that would then lead them south to Capernaum, runs right past Caesarea Philippi. So Jesus could have said, hey, um, while we're in the neighborhood, let's just pull over here and uh, I got to show you something. But he didn't. They went back to the Sea of Galilee, where he fed the 5,000. He cast the demons out of the Gerasene demoniac and the other stuff, and then took them back there, a special trip to that location. Now, when we start talking about all this stuff, the megalithic structures that are all over the Golan Heights, the megalithic structures around this valley, they've identified more than a thousand megalithic tombs or funerary monuments called dolmens on the uh, hills overlooking this, this valley. A dolmen is, is from a, uh, the word means table. It comes from a Britonic word. Uh, Britonic is a Celtic language, you know, like Irish or, or you know, Scott. Um, anyway, it uh, was, was named because a couple of British soldiers back in the 19th century saw these things and said, oh, we've got these back in Ireland. We call them tables, dolmens. So anyway, more than a thousand of them around this valley and more than 5,600 have been identified on the Golan Heights. I mean, this is it, the Golan Heights, which is the ancient kingdom of Og of Bashan, was essentially a, um, a necropolis. It was a place devoted to the cult of the dead. You've got so many dolmens on the Golan that the Israeli archaeologists who led the survey, where they literally walked across the land and marked, okay, we found 10 of them here, and here's a little sketch showing where they are in the landscape. He said they can't use the term dolmen field to describe clusters of dolmens anymore because they don't know where one ends and the next one begins. I, they, there are at least 5,600 because there are probably a lot more that just haven't been found or identified yet. And they've been looking since 1967 when the Israelis took the Golan Heights away from Syria. The Golan Heights also has several very bizarre megalithic monuments. One of these people probably heard of is called Gilgal Rephaim. It uh, dates to about 3750 BC, which means it's about 1,200 years older, at least, than Stonehenge. It's like five massive concentric rings of stone around a central tumulus, which is a big pile of rocks put around a central core, which you can enter. And this was built, again, almost 6,000 years ago, so that when the sun rose on the solstice, it would shine in through a little gap just above the opening into a stone that they call a threshold stone that you have to cross to get into the central area. Um, it's been damaged over the years because it's geologically, a lot of earthquakes, very active. And so some of the stones in the walls have shaken out. And over the years, Bedouin tribes have come in there and they've repurposed the stones to make sheep pens or whatever. But you can see on some of these areas that haven't been disturbed that the, the, the brickwork, well, it's not brickwork, it's basically um, unfinished stone and just dry stone. Uh, but the work is very, very well done. So they had some engineering chops back on the Golan Heights 6,000 years ago. Um, it's about 25 miles, but 30 miles south of Mount Hermon. You can see Mount Hermon to the north, due north, on a clear day. Just 10 years ago, Pastor Doug Van Dorn, who wrote the book Giants, Sons of the Gods, noticed with Google Earth a serpent-shaped ridge about a quarter of a mile north of there. And we've taken to calling it the Serpent Mound of Bashan because it looks like a serpent. And it's got 140 megalithic burials on the back of this, as well as some dwellings. There were some houses on the back of this, which may have belonged to a priestly class that tended to the rituals at Gilgal Rephaim. I mean, literally, it's a quarter of a mile, you know, 1,500 feet. Um, when we first went there, 2018, 2019, 
we were all looking at you know the big pile of rocks over there. We didn't notice this three quarter of a mile long serpent shaped ridge on the left as we were looking over there at uh, Gilgal Rephaim. Uh, we did get a chance to go there this time and spent a day with the archaeologist who's done the most recent excavations at the serpent mound and at Gilgal Rephaim. But to give you an idea how big that serpent mound is, it's three times longer, four times higher than the serpent mound in Ohio. It's 200 feet wide and can, you know, this consistent serpent shape, 200 feet wide, covered with 140 of these megalithic tombs, uh, some of which were up to 20 feet high originally. They've kind of, again, with the stones have kind of shaken over the years with earthquakes. And what we discovered, I can't say we discovered because the archaeologists have known about this. What we learned during our tour back in March is that there are three more of those structures on the Golan Heights that nobody knows about, uh, except for the archeologists who've actually done some digging on this kind of thing, but they've not promoted a lot of this. I think they must think this is kind of, you know, woo talk and you'll get a lot of crazy uh, new agers or something uh, like, like Stonehenge gets every year on the summer solstice. Uh, and, and by the way, I will say that when we went into the central core at Gilgal Rephaim, we found little votive candles sitting around inside the central core. We were there before the tour arrived. We went there on a Thursday. And when we came back with the tour group on Tuesday, there were fresh candles that weren't there when we'd been there the previous Thursday. So these other ones, these other sites similar to Gilgal Rephaim are not as big. Um, they're uh, from about a third to half the size. What's fascinating though, is that one of them, is, which is called Kerbet Bateha, which means it's Arabic, it means ruins of Beth Saida, is on the east bank of the Jordan River, two miles north of the Sea of Galilee. It's half a mile from the hometown of Peter, Andrew, and Philip, Beth Saida. It's uh, instead of 500 feet across, like Gilgal Rephaim, it's about 200 feet across, but it's the same essential idea. These big concentric rings made of stone. And this one, like I said, it's on the east bank of the Jordan River, but the bank of the river slopes down there about 100 feet down to the river level. And it's a gentle slope, meaning it would make a really, really interesting theater. People could sit and watch what was going on down at the river, or perhaps if somebody was talking on the far side of the river, a good place for them to address the crowd. We think that location, and Doug Van Dorn, Judd Burton, and I have talked about this, we think that was the location of Jesus' baptism. We also think that was where Jesus fed the 5,000, which according to the gospels, that took place in a desolate area outside or near Bethsaida, which again is only half a mile away. There is no way that Peter, Andrew, Philip, and everybody from Bethsaida 2,000 years ago didn't know that this place was there. And when you put the clues together and see that according to the gospel of John, it was like the next day after Jesus was baptized that uh, John, one of John the Baptist's um, disciples, Andrew, starts following Jesus. He runs home to get Peter. So they couldn't have been that far away. They certainly weren't 90 miles away near Jericho, like the United mm -hmm. Nations thinks. So that area is very interesting. And this gets back to why I think this is relevant and worthy of Christians' study. All of this would be nothing more than just uh, archaeological, you know, fasc fascinating archaeological information, except that Jesus did these things in these areas. We believe this is where he was baptized. John 128 says these things occurred in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The Greek word in, in uh, uh, there was a word in Greek translated Bethany is Bethania. Now people have been, Christians been trying to find Bethany across the Jordan for 2000 years. This across the Jordan means east of the Jordan River. There is no town, no place called Bethany east of the Jordan River. The only one is on the Mount of Olives. And that's not across the Jordan. That's across the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem, across from the Temple Mount. So in the third century, early third century, one of the early church theologians, a guy named Origen, traveled from Alexandria to 
what then was called Palestine, to try to find this place. And he said, he, he wrote and admitted that even though the oldest and best copies of the Gospel of John read in Greek, Bethania, he said that must be wrong because nobody here has ever heard of a place called Bethania. So it must have been Beth Abara, which means house of the crossing. And that's that place near Jericho that the United Nations has picked. And this is why the King James Version to this day in John 1 verse 28 doesn't read Bethany, it reads Beth Abara. Origen changed it, and then Jerome, when he translated the Bible into Latin, the Vulgate, he followed Origen's translation. But in 1877, a guy by the name of Claude Condor, who was an explorer sent by the Palestine Exploration Fund, said, you know, Bethania is probably a transliteration of the first century name of the region north of the Sea of Galilee, Batania, which is the Latin form of Bashan. So John wasn't baptizing in Bethany across the Jordan. It was in Bashan across the Jordan. Why would Bashan matter? Well, because that was the place so covered with megalithic monuments to the dead, even in the days of Jesus, that it was known that Bashan was the literal entrance to the netherworld. That's the reputation that it had for centuries, millennia, before Jesus walked the earth. And that's where John was baptizing. That's where Jesus got baptized, according to John 1, verse 35. And that's where Jesus called his first disciples. And that's at the bottom end, the south end of that valley that uh, the Jordan ran, runs through to this day between Mount Hermon and the Sea of Galilee. So Again, all of this would just be, okay, interesting academic exercise. What does it have to do with us as Christians? Well, it points to the fact that this is a war against the spirits of the dead. In other words, demons. And Jesus showed that it was important by where he chose to be baptized and where he chose to declare his divinity. And where he based his ministry, right there in that region that was known in the ancient world as the entrance to the netherworld. Uh, that's interesting. It puts a lot of pieces to the puzzle. Uh, is that Dolmen area, would that be the Valley of the Shadow of Death? Well, yeah, and, and I'll give you the Bible verse that, that <clears throat> led us to this conclusion. Um, in Matthew chapter 4, after Jesus is um, tempted, according to Matthew, he's led up into the wilderness, and again, we assume wilderness, he's in Judea, that's the territory of Judah, which is around Jerusalem and south. He must be down near Qumran. In the first century, Judea referred to a much bigger geographic area. It was basically the area under the control of the Jews, which included everything even further north, north of the Sea of Galilee. And interestingly, by the way, uh, Doug Van Dorn pointed this out. The word translated wilderness in the New Testament is the Greek word eremon. And we can't prove this, but we think that that word translated wilderness, eremon, may be etymologically connected to the Hebrew word behind the name Mount Hermon, the word harem, which means um, forbidden or under the ban, as in, you know, this is uh, unclean, touch this and you die. The, there were cities in the book of Joshua, the cities of the Amorites that were declared Kerem, and those were the cities that were devoted to destruction. You see that over and over again in the book of Joshua. But we think that that may be behind the Greek word eremon, translated as wilderness or desert in the New Testament. So anyway, Jesus is taken out into the wilderness. Um, he's uh, hungry and he resists. He's taken to the top of the temple and uh, says, you know, tell the angels to bear you bear you up and he he rebukes him and then the devil takes him to a very high mountain well, mount hermon is the only very high mountain in or around israel it is like three times higher than the next highest mountain in israel and uh this is where satan tempts him by showing him all the kingdoms of the world and saying i'll give these to you if you'll just bow the knee to me and then after that the devil leaves him and angels came and ministered to him and then in uh matthew 4 beginning at verse 12 now, when he heard that John had been arrested, this is John the Baptist, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun 
and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. In the beginning of verse 15 in Matthew 4, he starts quoting from Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, and that's part of the Messianic prophecy that includes those verses we hear every year around Christmas time. Uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Okay, this is the beginning of that, uh, that chapter in Isaiah. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, that's the, uh, the Roman road called the Via Maris, which ran from Alexandria, Egypt, up through the, uh, the Carmel Range near Megiddo, uh, went down to um, Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee, and then tracked around the shore of the Sea of Galilee, then went north up through this valley from Capernaum up to the site of uh, ancient Hatsor, and then it cut off to the northeast toward Damascus. The way of the sea beyond the Jordan. So, now, okay, now he's identifying us. The way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the Roman road east of the Jordan River, uh, Galilee of the Gentiles. Galilee of the Gentiles. Now, here's the money quote, verse 16 of Matthew 4. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Jesus moving to Capernaum, the south end of this valley, ringed by more than a thousand of these giant megalithic dolmens, um, that, according to Matthew, was fulfillment of this prophecy, bringing a light to the region and shadow of death. Now, when you connect this to Psalm 23, Sharon did this at a conference a few years ago uh, outside, um, outside Nashville, and she explained you know, again, the word dolmen literally means table. And the most simple form of a dolmen is two uh, big vertical slabs of stone with a, a, a horizontal slab, a tabletop, if you will, put across the top. In the Jordan Valley, and really between Mount Hermon and the Dead Sea, there are more than 25,000 that have been identified. There are more of them clustered closer together in that region, the Jordan Valley and, and the Golan Heights, than anywhere on Earth. Um, you find them all over the place. They're in the Caucasus Mountains. Korea's got a bunch. Um, as I mentioned, they're, they're in the UK, Ireland, Scotland have some. Uh, there are some people who say they've seen dolmens here in the United States, which would be really interesting, because again, it speaks to the, uh, this culture being almost global. Uh, there are dolmens in, in Europe, Spain, France, uh, but more of them in and around Israel, and especially the Jordan Valley and the Golan Heights than anywhere on planet Earth. And when you read the 23rd Psalm and read that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Like when Sharon read that line, in, in, in Nashville, this Nashville conference, Murfreesboro, actually, uh, there were like 200 people in the room and they all went, ah, at once. But I think now, you know, when we can say, you know, we can identify where this place is, we think, because of the Matthew 4 quotation of the Isaiah 9 prophecy, I think we can say, this is the valley of the shadow of death. It was surrounded by these, these megalithic monuments to the dead. In fact, we visited one site on the northeast corner of that Tahula Valley. It's uh, near a kibbutz called Shamir, which is only 20 miles from Mount Hermon. And about uh, 10 years ago, they noticed that the biggest dolmen in this dolmen field around the Shamir kibbutz, got about 400 dolmens in it. This one is massive, the capstone, that tabletop, they estimate at about 50 tons. I mean, 50 tons, that's two fully loaded flatbed 16, 18 wheelers on an American highway. That's a lot. And yet somehow 5,000 years ago, they managed to lever this stone up into place on top of the vertical slabs. And, and the reason they paid attention to this is because they found some uh, petroglyphs on the underside of that capstone. And to the best of my knowledge, based on what I read from the archeologists who excavated that, uh, that dolmen, it's the only one they found north of Yemen that has petroglyphs in it. 
Now they, they don't know what they mean. There are like 14 inscriptions. They all look like the Greek character uh, Psi, which is like the Indiana U University logo, you know, I with a U on it. It's kind of what it looks like. Why are they there? Have no idea. Could have been the guy who was, you know, working in there one day, got bored and just, you know, was doodling. I don't know. But this dolmen was in the center of the largest cluster of dolmens around the uh, the Hula Valley, the valley surrounded by these dolmens. So they believed that that was the center of the culture that built those. And they did find some human remains in this one, which is unusual. Most dolmens do not have any human remains in them. Scholars don't agree as to what they're for. Were they burial tombs, or burial chambers? Or were they just there to commemorate the dead? They argue about it to this day. They don't know. But excavating these things for 120 years, they have no clue, no idea. But what we do know is that that area, that valley through which the Jordan River flows, connecting essentially Mount Hermon to the Sea of Galilee, was not only important in uh, to Jesus, clearly, but we, we know from pagan texts dating from the time of the judges that it was believed that the god Baal had had some activity in that Hula Valley uh, and that the Sea of Galilee was known as a place of burial for people of honor, you know, of high status, um, because it was believed that that was connected somehow to the underworld gods, the Eretz Elohim or Elohim Eretz, the Rephaim. The Canaanites around ancient Israel knew who the Rephaim were, and they venerated them. And they passed this along to the Greeks and the Romans in the form of hero worship. So this region was really important for thousands of years before the time of Jesus. And again, it would all just be archaeologically interesting, except that Jesus, I mean, Jesus, when he walked the earth, could have said, you know, all of this stuff about venerating the ancestors, that's all a bunch of hooey. That doesn't really work. Those aren't the spirits of the ancestors. Those are demons or, or you know, there are no such thing as ghosts. That's not what he said. And he went there again to base his ministry there, to be baptized there, to declare his divinity there at Mount Hermon, both at the base of it and then with the transfiguration on the summit. He was tempted there by Satan. So there's something spiritually significant about that location. And uh, again, we're going to argue, uh, Sharon's going to give her talk on the 23rd Psalm, and I'm going to do mine on the Essenes and the Book of Parables and all of this. And this is all going to go into our, our forthcoming book called The Gates of Hell. Well, that is, that's a lot there. I'll tell you, you know, um, many years ago, uh, you know, I started my research and I studied this stuff. Basically, what you're saying is where Jesus was baptized and baptism symbolizes baptized out in, in the dead, you know, for the, you, you die in baptism and raise a new life, all that. Jesus was simply picking a fight. He say, I yeah. am the judge. I'm coming back. I'm kicking, I'm kicking your tail in now. And that's exactly what he was doing. And uh, before, when he went across the Sea of Galilee, Sea of Galilee is the navel of the world is what I taught for years. And the winds came up and that would be symbolized in Lil. Enlil, the spirit of the north, uh, yeah, you know, north wind, and then is a navel. Uh, if I understand, it was a navel of the uh, of the earth, and underneath there would be Inki, the god of sweet water. The god, yeah, the god of the abyss, the god of and the, the god of the abyss, yeah. and yeah. then he met Legion, <laughs> the guy Legion. It all fits, right. and Legion was where in the tombs, just above the Sea of Galilee, right? Yeah, and so, and then from there he went over to. Uh, uh, to um pan's grotto <laughs> over there and you know and and peter says you are christ the son of the living god and you, know, you you know you 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 are you're a god you know you're a god in the flesh here oh well, you're the one that's going to bring justice in the world and so it sounds like jesus was just picking a fight <laughs> And, uh, you know, that's just amazing to me because it adds a little more dimension to the Bible study that, you know, I've been doing in the book of John and other other studies I've done. But it just it, it reminds me of that. It's like a prize fighter. It's almost like, you know, these wrestling matches. I know they're fake, but they're, they're, they're challenging each other. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you want to mess with me? <laughs> I'll mess yeah, up. I, th I think that's exactly uh, what it was. I'll take you all on. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's exactly what it was. He he declared 
war on these entities from the time of his baptism. He declared his divinity to his followers at the base of Mount Hermon. But then when he took Peter, James, and John up the mountain and was transfigured, that was uh, sending a very clear message into the spirit realm. Yeah, I am the one. What are you going to do about it? And then from there, he started making his way back to Jerusalem to fulfill his mission. But you're right. Uh, all of this stuff on the Sea of Galilee would not have been lost on his followers. Um, you know, stilling the storm. Um, you know, the sea in the Old Testament, especially, often represents chaos, primordial chaos, Leviathan. And Leviathan. so, by stilling the storm, he was stilling chaos in the same way that God subdued chaos in Genesis one verse two in order to create humanity or a place where humanity could could thrive. Um, uh, the storm god of the Canaanites, Baal, who was uh, identified by Jesus as Satan, both in Matthew 12, verses 22 through 26, and Revelation 2.13. Uh, you know, 2.13 is reference to the great altar of Zeus at Pergamum, in the letter of Pergamum. Uh, Zeus was just the uh, Greek form of, of Baal. So, you know, Jesus, it, it, between legion and casting out the, the demons, which were the spirits of the giants destroyed in the flood, distilling the storm, and calming Satan, and then walking on the water after the feeding of the 5,000, subduing chaos. Um, yeah, it's, uh, he, he basically did a lot of stuff there at the Sea of Galilee that is a lot more significant than most of us have been taught. Yeah, treading on chaos, walking across the sea. Right. That, that is something in the ancient world I know of victory. That's a victory lap, a victory dance. Yes. So that's just amazing. Yeah, you know, before we, uh, I, I want to keep going, but anyway, we'll take as long as we can. But, uh, you know, and I'm thinking, now let's go take a step into the future. Because I was watching uh, Skywatch TV uh, show, you guys were on it, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, whatever. I know you aired early, probably. But, um, and so you're talking about the, the watchers coming back. And how would that relate to the Valley of the Shadow, Mount Hermon, all this stuff? Are we going to see the the return of the Watchers? You think again on the planet somehow, or or because evidently the war is not over yet. Jesus is coming back. No, and, that that is true. Um, and I, I think a lot of us assume. I I certainly did that. The Watchers is a term given to those evil angels who sinned in Genesis chapter six, and uh, they're they're specifically called Watchers in in the Book of First Enoch. But that is a term that also applies to loyal Elohim, loyal spirit beings. Angel is kind of too narrow of a term. Um, we see this in Daniel chapter 4, where Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and uh, Daniel interprets it. And essentially, it is that uh, uh, these uh, the watchers decreed Nebuchadnezzar's punishment for his uh, excessive pride. Um, so, and they say this is by the decree of the watchers. So it appears that they have some authority, some power in the spirit realm, the loyal ones anyway. So I, you know, best guess uh, is that watcher is a, a specific class of supernatural being, a type of angel, if you will. And there are some good ones and there are some bad ones. And some of the bad ones who sinned prior to the flood are now in the abyss, according to 2 Peter 2, verse 4. God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but thrust them down to Tartarus, is the word in Greek, not Hades. They're not in hell. They're in a special place below Hades, below hell, below Sheol. Um, but after the Tower of Babel incident, according to Deuteronomy 32, God delegated a uh, uh, responsibility to a group of sons of God, B'nai Ha Elohim. This is the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. In verse 8, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, that's a reference to Babel, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. So apparently, God said, okay, look, you were trying to build an artificial mountain to make contact or reestablish contact with the spirit realm, after I punished this group that was messing around with you before the flood and sent them down to the abyss, you want to deal with them instead of me? All right, I'll give you what you want, but you're not going to be happy about it. 
it, it's sort of the way he uh, gave Israel a king when they were agitating for a king so they could be like all the other nations. I said, okay, you're not going to like it. And they got Saul, who turned out to be a really bad king. Well, according to this verse in Deuteronomy 32, and then you go back and you see it's uh, corroborated by Deuteronomy 4, verse 19, uh, when God tells Moses to warn the Israelites, and I quote, Beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, the heavenly army, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. End quote. God basically sent another delegation after the flood of lesser Elohim, perhaps of watcher class, and people began worshiping them as their gods. And I think this was a test not only for the people after the flood, but also or after Babel, rather. This was also a test and a trap, is the way Sharon puts it, a test and a trap of these uh, spirit beings that God delegated this uh, responsibility to. So my point in, in all of this, coming back to your question now, will the watchers return? I think there are watchers already here, watchers that have been here since the aftermath of the Tower of Babel. I think those are the entities that God is referring to in Psalm 82, which is essentially a courtroom scene in heaven. Uh, in verse 1 of Psalm 82, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? In the verse 6, he, he says, I said, you are gods, you are Elohim, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. And I, I know there's some people who look at Psalm 82 and say, yeah, but Jesus quoted that in John 10 to the Pharisees and the scribes. And so Psalm 82 actually refers to, you know, human judges who are ruling wickedly. It's like, look, I'm sorry, but in the midst of the gods, in the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. That word Elohim in Hebrew never refers to humans. It just doesn't. So people are trying to use John 10 as a, to, to debunk Psalm 82 um, are really missing the point. They're trying to tell Hebrews, uh, Jews, that they don't know what their own language means. Elohim, you are Elohim, sons of the Most High, all of you. God is not condemning human judges. He's condemning these lesser Elohim, these angels, if you will, who were delegated responsibility for shepherding humanity after Babel. So some of these entities are still here. Satan would be one of them. Uh, we would argue that the whore of Babylon, who we think is the spirit that the Sumerians called Inanna, the Babylonians called Ishtar, we believe she's another one. There are a number of others out there that we could uh, go through a name, but yeah, I think there are watchers who are already here. Now, it sounds a little more ominous. It's more clickbait -y to say the return of the watchers. Uh, and yes, there will be these watchers who come out of the abyss in Revelation chapter 9. The king of the bottomless pit, again, I will argue, is Shemiyaza, Saturn, Kronos, Molech to the Hebrews, the destroyer. Um, you know, he, he will lead this charge, but when they get out, they've only got five months. So um, I think the church is going to be out of here by that point, before the abyss opens up. But um, you know, we'll find out. Even if not, they won't be able to touch us, because they will only be able to harm those without the seal of God in their foreheads. So if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, whether you're here or not, your future is secure, and these things cannot, will not touch you. Um, so yeah, uh, to answer your question in the short form, yes, the watchers are coming back, but a whole lot of them are already here which explains why the world is in such a mess today. Yeah, it does. You know, I've been doing a whole series on uh, just something I've been doing for many years. And so, and so I've been studying the occult world and looking at uh, Gnosticism and the Gnosticism is uh, it's a parasitic religion. There's different forms, different denominations of Gnosticism. And one of them, uh, one of them is theosophy. And mm -hmm. the reason why I started looking at theosophy because it lays it out everything in a clear thing especially alice bailey and she's the mother of the new age movement and so uh you know i people who who uh are familiar with what i share on um let's see it says um externalization of hierarchy page 193 she goes and tells that the world has reached a crisis today because it's uh 
clarification will be an outstanding theme of all progress, educational, religious, and economic until AD 2025. And all of a sudden she started mentioning dates. So that got hmm. me uh, cued in because I go, what in the world is she talking about? So I typed in 2025 and I, I was actually blown away. And, um, and then it goes on the next paragraph, just today, as humanity awaits a revelation which will embody the thoughts and dreams and construct the gold of the new age. In other words, what she's talking about here to wrap it up is that we're going to enter into a new golden dawn, a new period of time, right around the leading up to the year 2025. Then on page 281, this kind of blew me away because it really blew me away because she identifies what I call fallen watchers, the ones that exist today that are fallen as um, she calls them actually watchers. She actually identifies the Antichrist as the silent watcher <laughs> who is relatively mm. sinless, who is going to come back and, and lead humanity in this new golden age of right human relations or right human relations is based on deception and so forth, et cetera. It, 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 as Larry Fink of you know the, the BR group would say, it's um, group conformity. That's what it mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So... So in page 281, this, listen to this, Derek. This is what she said. Thus, a great new movement is proceeding and tremendously increased interplay and interaction is taking place. This will go on until AD 2025. During the years intervening between now and then, very great changes will be seen taking place. The present cycle from now until that date is called technically the stage of the forerunner. It is preparatory in nature, testing in its methods and intended to be revelatory in its techniques and results. In, adjustment in the adjustment necessitated by the rapidly advancing alignment, members of the hierarchy are fitting themselves for the objective work of public expression. That just kind of blew me away. So I did a little further research. I found out what their public expression is. It's, it's, it's based on mass possession. It sounds crazy, but, you know, some people, you know what, what are we seeing in the world today? How do you explain this? Yeah. You see, you've seen mass possession. And there's a type of possession that's going to overtake uh, people in the religious community, educational community, business community, financial community, and philosophy. And basically, the, the, all the cultural mountains of influence will be taken over by overshadowed people. Overshadowed is a form of possession where you maintain your mental faculties. And you're reasonable. It's like a, uh, it's like in the 2003 edition of the Battlestar Galactica. They take the Cylons, put a switch on, and they know they're a Cylon. That's what happens. They start talking politics, whatever. It, the switch goes on, and mm -hmm. they they have a goal to bring back somebody from the abyss. This the Silent Watcher. They want to take over everything, and they're going to implement chaos in the world order out of chaos that's what that she's talking about and on page 298 to 299 i can't um do the whole thing but she says the hierarchical determinations are concerned were postponed but owing to the unexpected preparedness of humanity can take place not prematurely but securely in the fullness of time the fullness of time as regards to particular planning which we are dealing is from now until the year 2025 a.d a brief period of time indeed this purpose is threefold in natures and and she goes on and says number two she says it predicates a great influx of initiates and disciples and a tremendous inflow of esoterically called angelic angelic essences called divas in other words there's going to be a great influx of people contacting angelic essences mm -hmm. <laughs> even in the church and they're going to lead them astray and promise them all kinds of things. And so when I look at this, and I, 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 I don't have time to go too much more into it, but one of the stages of this leading up to it is an, an influx, inrush of androgyny will be normal. Yeah, we're certainly seeing that, yeah. And it will be in your face. It'll be like the days of Lot in your face. They'll be chanting something not about wanting men or your men. <laughs> they want somebody else. You'll be hearing that strangely, mm -hmm. oddly enough. And we are, and we're getting, how many years away are we? 2025, two, two not, years. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not not very far away. In fact, I, while you were talking, I, I just did a quick search and it's surprising. This is right out there in the open um, at lucistrust.org, uh, which is, uh, 
based on the name of the publishing company that Alice Bailey, the, the company, or uh, I, I would say almost ministry that Alice Bailey founded to propagate the, the theosophic teachings of Blavatsky. Um, they've got the, the externalization of the hierarchy published online here. And um, it says very plainly here, I'm going to try to find this again, uh, that uh, it's all going to take place. There you go. A, a great and new movement is proceeding and a tremendously increased interplay and interaction is taking place. This will go on until AD 2025. During the years intervening between now and then, very great changes will be seen taking place and that the great general assembly of the hierarchy, as usual every century in 2025, the date in all probability will be set for the first stage of the externalization of the hierarchy. So, um, yeah, New Agers drawing on these theosophic teachings of Blavatsky and Bailey are looking for something very significant around 2025, it, it appears. And I don't think it's a coincidence, Brian, that we're seeing um, a lot of th that date popping up in things like uh, the deadline date, for example, for the Federal Reserve Bank to launch its uh, new central bank digital currency, the Bank of England want to still, wants to launch by 2025. Um, so, and, and you know, between 2025 and 2030, a lot of really interesting things going to take place. The World Economic Forum, of course, famously predicted that by 2030, you will own nothing and you'll be happy. Um, so they're looking at the next few years being really significant. But of course, uh, yeah, as we mentioned during the recording session for Tom's Wormwood prophecy several years ago, um, and Tom is uh, you know basing this on a dream that he was given that uh, the the asteroid coming in for a near pass on April thirteenth of twenty twenty nine asteroid Apophis, named for the Egyptian chaos dragon, um, that this was the uh, the, the the judgment in Revelation 8 called Wormwood, you know, this great flaming thing from the sky um, that there are some who believe that that arrives at the midpoint of the seven year great tribulation. Now, you know, a lot of people who don't believe that, but OK, if it turns out that, that is the case. And as we were on the set discussing this, I was looking at the calendar because I realized, OK, April 13th, where is that on the Hebrew calendar? Oh, okay. That falls the seventh day of uh, after, rather, the Passover. Seventh day after the Passover. So, what is three and a half years before that? If that's the midpoint of the seven year Great Tribulation, back up three and a half years, you come to October 13th of 2025, 2025, and uh, that is the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot, which was the most important festival on the Jewish calendar back in the day, uh, they would have to sacrifice just a, a crazy amount of, of bulls as part of this festival. Seven on day one, eight on day two, nine on day three, 10 on day four, until they'd sacrificed 70 bulls. And that 70 is a number that not just in ancient Israel, but all of the ancient Near East represented all of them, the complete set. In other words, those 70 bulls represented the gods of the nations, those fallen watchers or sons of God who were placed over the nations in Deuteronomy 32, according to Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, after Babel, God telling his people, these are who I'm res rescuing you from, the gods of the nations. So every year in the fall, they would have that ritual where they would do the seven-day festival, slaughter those bulls, sacrifice those bulls uh, to remind the people of Israel. This is what Yahweh is saving us from. And isn't it interesting that that falls three and a half years, pretty much to the day before the arrival of asteroid Apophis, which if it's Wormwood and if it's that is actually the midpoint of the Great Tribulation, um, that seven day period after celebrating the, the Passover would represent the anniversary of the fall of the walls of Jericho, seven days after the Passover. So now is that going to happen that way? I don't know. I don't know. But there are an awful lot of folks looking at 2025 as a really significant date. As Josh Peck and Ken Johnson wrote in their book, um, the Essenes believed that the last age, the last era of this age would begin. The final 50-year uh, period would begin in 2025.
So we're getting close. We're getting close. We'll see what we shall see, as they say. Yeah. You know, I, I sit there and I also saw all this about leading up to this point, we'll see a push against what Alice Bailey was. What's the quote here? You can look it up sometime, Derek. It is Reappearance of Christ, Lucius Publishing. It's a 48 edition, page 180, 89. I kind of read the whole thing. It just talks about reactionary groups. And reactionary groups are... Um, define them for you people who believe in jesus jewish people who believe in in in, in, in yahweh you know jehovah the uh, christians conservatives libertarians free thinkers you're a reactionary person and you have to be arrested or delayed she used nice terms but basically you have to be eradicated <laughs> they're, they're they're planning a war an open war around 2025 is what i'm saying I thought that was interesting considering the book of Revelation where the Antichrist makes war with, with the saints. I don't know if the Antichrist will appear then, not saying that at all, because I don't know. I'm just, just, this is just mere speculation, what I found, and I'm not trying to read anything into it at all, but I'm just using it as logical where my research goes. And I'm seeing this intense, insane hate toward Christians, conservatives, free thinkers. If you dare question the narrative, you're silenced, you're censored. I'm not making that up. That's happening. Mm -hmm. And oddly, it's happening in the years before 2025. What's even more bizarre, I don't know if people have time that can handle this part or not, but H.P. Blavatsky talks about seven root races. Root races are right. not uh, about human race at all. It has to do with uh, the Gnosticism where the Demiurge God, which would be the God of, of all creation, you know, the Christian God, uh, upstart God, you know, made the material world and they want to get back to a pure spirit world. So human manichae has to go through seven stages. So H.P. Blavatsky said in 1870s, we're in the fifth uh, age of uh, age of initiation would be the best way to put it. At the beginning of the sixth age calls for and she wrote this in 1870 calls for the destruction of the united states and western europe in order to create chaos to make a new humanity it's just it's really bizarre when you look at it and i'm, I'm standing there and going, wow and one of the things the tools will be used will be androgyny again and so mm. I'm, I'm connecting it. And then what's really bizarre is that Edgar Casey wrote a, this weird prophecy, said that in 2014, something will happen, or 2015, in that frame. And at that point is when people, uh, I think it was the, the eye of Saturn thing was really big in um, TV commercials and movies and stuff that people were watching. And, but anyway, it seemed like maybe possibly i'm just saying hypothetically this could be in the occult world their view is to, to get into the six root race age calls for the destruction of the united states and western europe and reshape it into a rules-based order and liberal world order what do you want to call it and mm -hmm. then um and then after that you can go into the seventh race and become super spiritual beings again you'll be you'll be super spirits you super uber mans uber women it's really sick stuff but but as we get closer to 2025 all the stuff starts to make sense and then you describe we'll get back to the dolmen area where you saw some of the ruins and you had candles lit inside of those things mm -hmm. um there is definitely a connection and uh you know with the occult world and what they're doing and I think Christians are largely ignorant of it, but we don't need to fear because Jesus already made a public spectacle of them openly and triumphed them. Right. And, and he did the victory lap, and we're going to do the victory laps with him, and he's going to get us out of here. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And I just can't wait. I can't wait. Well, that's, that's the thing to remember. Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and imagine a vain thing? Yeah, so, they, they laid it he all who out. Sits, have a, yeah. He who sits in the heavens laughs, he holds them in derision. Yeah, they, they're, they're, these, these fools who run the world today think they're winning. And uh, they're, they're just not seeing the, the whole picture.
And you know, Jesus gave us authority over these things, and we have spiritual warfare to do. We have a task to do for Jesus still. We don't give up. We have to make a stand, and that's what people need to understand. That's what we're here for. And mm-hmm. it looks bleak and stuff, and people can you know get you know I get upset sometimes. I want to crawl under a rock and hide, but no, you got to stand tall and face it because that's what we're here for. You know, I, I'm sure Stephen, when he was martyred, you know he you know he wasn't prepared for that day, but all of a sudden it was thrust upon him, and he made a stand, and that's kind of a stand sometimes we might have to make, or you know we got to you know realize we're fighting against evil. It really exists. And their spiritual powers behind evil. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, a large segment, I'm not all of it, but a large segment of the church doesn't even talk about this, doesn't deal with the subject of spiritual warfare, anything like that. Anyway, I just kind of want to end it on that and give back into a plug back into your spiritual warfare conference. <laughs> In- well, this uh, again is not not specifically spiritual warfare, but there will be some people who are expert in it. So if this is something that uh, you need to learn more about, especially if you're dealing with things like uh, night terror, sleep paralysis, demonic oppression, uh, Dr. Gregory Reed, Vicki Joy Anderson, Thomas Dunn, they will be there. Uh, Dr. Michael Lake, L.A. Marzulli, um, Dr. Mike Spaulding, uh, sound theologian, but also understands that the, the spirit realm is real. And so uh, this this gathering coming up July 28th and 29th in Ohio at uh, Brookline, Ohio, which is just outside Dayton. Um, yeah, take advantage of it if you can, because uh, the, the lineup, you can see all of the speakers at uh, gotherefortconference.com. And uh, David Hebner, another who deals with uh, deliverance, and he uh, being a Hollywood insider, a, uh, I mean, you look up his IMDB credits, and you see that this is a guy who was like one of the most prolific writers, directors, actors in Hollywood working in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and he gave it up because he realized this is not, you know, what what I should be doing. Um, he will be there, and there's a lot of ministering that goes on at these conferences. So uh, it's the last weekend in July, Friday and Saturday, the 28th and the 29th at the Harvest Revival Center. If you can't be there, I, I just encourage you to get the video uh, because, as I said, as we're getting older and we just look at the reality around us, we've we've lost a number of good friends in ministry here just within the last couple of years. Dr. Michael Heiser. Um, Russ and Shelly Dizdar, uh, Rob Skiba, and, and others. And as we get older, it's going to be more difficult for us to travel as well. So when you get a group, um, this dynamic together in one place, boy, take advantage of it. So um, you can find out more registration online at gothereforeconference.com. And thank you for letting me plug it, because I know Mike Spaulding, Kathy Spaulding are putting in all kinds of work. P- Neil Peterson and his team at Harvest Revival Center uh, they really deserve the support to make this a, a full house. Amen. I, I just want to give that that information down. I'm going to put it on the screen, and uh, I would like for everybody to support that. Log into it, subscribe to it. You know, log into it. Go there, go there, go there, and see it. I'll probably log into it and pay the fifty nine because um, we we just got back from vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I know this how to plan my vacation in in Ohio, but <laughs> well, it's it's good to sleep in your own bed. That yeah. that is that is true. It is a yeah. blessing. But anyway, thanks, Derek, for coming on to uh, Christian Marauder, and I hope to have you back sometime. We can continue on because I can go all kinds of different directions right now, but it's getting about our time limit right now. And with that, you guys all be blessed, and just look on your screen. I have all the contact information for Derek and the and the um, upcoming end of july conference as well as derek's book so just go ahead and look on on your screen and we'll see you next time god bless you